Wonderful. Thank you so much. And welcome, everybody, once again. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for everyone, according to the place they are connecting from. So this is a new edition of the Decolonizing Dialogues that we are having thanks to the ICTM, the International Council for Traditional Music. And first of all, I wanted to, um, to, to, to show my gratitude and, and greet all the organizing team behind the organization and behind these dialogues in specific. I will also would like to say uh, good morning and thank you for being here for all my uh, teammates for this discussion that we have entitled I think uh, Jorge had a problem with his internet, so maybe can I can I take it from him from from it? So until he comes back. So we entitled our presentation as notes for a practical concept of decoloniality in the context of music and dance practice, and. Um, I think I, Jorge would do that. Uh, he would present every, everyone that is presenting, and then we will pass the video that we recorded to everyone that is here. So maybe I can start presenting my, my colleagues, and then uh, Jorge can come and take it when he recovers his internet. So uh, first I will present Juan, the Juan Felipe Miranda Medina, is a researcher, dancer, and musician from Arequipa, Peru. Juan is the director of the project Contrapunto, the living footsteps of Afro-Peruvian Zapateo. He holds several ongoing collaborations with Afro-Peruvian artists to co-produce reflexive knowledge about Afro-Peruvian practices and heritage. And his interest in the coloniality is centered around the questions of ethics and freedom in a contemporary context. Uh, we will also present my, my classmate, my colleague and friend, uh, Maria Jose. Maria Jose Bejarano is a Costa Rican researcher, dance movement therapist, and community dance artist. She has worked in several initiatives around the topics of ICH and social change in Costa Rica, Argentina, Colombia, and Uruguay. And her interests concern community practices Space building social transformation through social arts and ICH. Um, well, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Nayara. I am a Brazilian historian, dance anthropologist, and oriental dancer interested in on the historical developments of the so-called belly dance and its relations with orientalism, colonialism, and nationalism in Egypt. And I believe that Jorge is soon coming, coming back, but as he was going to introduce himself, I am uh, briefly introduce Jorge. Jorge is um, he's a lawyer, he is, uh, um, he's a researcher in, in the cases of ICH and the misappropriation of dance practices, and he's pretty much interested in the topics of let me remember what Jorge research is um, about the cases of misappropriation, ICH, and the legal intakes of dance and arts. And I think it is. That's the overall, like, that's the four presenters of the session. And I think we can uh, pass through the video. And in the end, if Jorge wants to take it over and present himself again, I think he can do it. So I thank you very much for the organizers for that. And please uh, share our videos with everyone that is here present. Thank you everyone for being here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Maria Jose Bejarano. I am from Costa Rica. And I am here today with my colleagues, Jorge Poveda, Juan Miranda, and Nayara Rota to share with you some of our thoughts about the concepts of decolonization and decolonial. We have been meeting for a year now to discuss these topics. And today we would like you to come into our conversations and enrich them with your views so that we can 
continue to build upon these topics in, 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 our, in our study group. Uh, we are a group of international students that um, have received formal education both in Latin America and in Europe. And these experiences have led to um, certain questions and um, reflections around the topic of the colonialism and the colonial thought and the colonial academia and what does it mean? What does it take us to? Um, where does it lead us in, in our practices, particularly in the study of dance and music? So we have been thinking of how our education in Latin America was centered in European texts. And um, that has created a lot of questions and reflections of how would it be if um, other regions would um, know the world or approach knowledge from a Latin American thought as it was declared universal. So imagine how would it be for you to approach reality and approach knowledge based on reading texts that are not written in your language in the first instance, and then uh, is, were not written in your context. So we would like you to imagine how would it be to, to approach reality from those texts and um, having those texts as the lens through which uh, see the reality you live in. So this is our experience of being educated with an Eurocentric point of view. And uh, we have discovered over, the, over time how other approaches have also built our lens to generate knowledge and, and discussions and reflections about reality and also to transform it. So this experience is a big question of how to open this, um, this, this sharing or this meeting. So Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, who is an, an Aymara academic from Bolivia, she says there are magical words in quotes and she um, asks us to problematize those magical words because she says that there are big categories that we as academic think we know and we understand, but, but if we go deeper into them and try to disengage from this determined meaning, then we will find some interesting things that, that may lead us to other places in our, in our research. So today, this is what we are trying to do, like going into what is uh, the colonial thought, what is the colonial, what is the colonization in academia and dance and music studies. And we would like you to come with us and participate to build upon this question and try to think how our thinking and theories are porous also to our practices. So how thinking is also a practice and how generating thought is also a practice that um, has an implication over reality and the understanding of reality. So this is our main aim for today to let you know what we have been thinking and to listen what would be your impressions about this and your reactions on this so we can and all enrich the discussion. So thank you very much for coming. And I will start with some reflections on the Latin American thinking. We want to start by um, referring to a historical aspect of Latin American thought where the critical thinking and the critical pedagogies took place. And it is important to say that the Latin American thought was marked by moments of unbearable power. Uh, dictatorships and conflict and war took over Latin American um, ground during the 60s and 70s. 
And this happened in Central America, Colombia, Brazil, Argentina. And this led to a lot of um, reflections on the categories we used for um, our approaches to reality and our uh, generation of knowledge from mainly from social sciences. So there, there has been a process of uh, rethinking and of reflection on this and how we approach to the others in anthropology and the different social groups and um, how this other knowledge <laughs> comes to the table and is invited to our academic spaces and how academia is built uh, within Eurocentric categories and that come from the colonial times. So these, uh, these times brought a lot of uh, reconstruction and revising of the, of the ways in which uh, academics approach uh, human groups and cultural studies and social sciences in general. And so um, this created uh, the critical thought, what we call the critical thought. And this means to unravel the structures that are created, fed and sustained by a certain kind of thinking about reality. So we are departing from the point of view that uh, states that the way we read reality is centered in the information that we have, in the, in the knowledge that we have been able to approach. And that leads us to certain um, understanding of life and the others and the building of our relationships among uh, cultural groups, among humans and among different perspectives also. So how we hierarchize different perspectives in knowledge or in information or um, different categories of understanding knowledge. So the critical thought searches to identify the power structures that leads to certain knowledge over other and legitimizes certain knowledge over others and how this marks our practices as well, how we approach to knowledge in our, in our research and how we um, understand the relationships in the field with the people that we work with with the groups and the, the phenomena or the objects of study that we have. So we are departing from this point of view, from this process of revisiting that it's, it's still going on and this, this meeting is part of it, how we create communication and exchange between different perspectives and try to make it as horizontal as possible uh, and not some voices and some approaches and some perspectives over others so that we, we can exchange. Hello, everyone. I am Nayara Rota Sunsão. And after this introduction by Maru, I would like to start to present some ideas regarding the concept of decoloniality through a Latin American perspective. So, as Mahu already explained, we are all Latin Americans that perceive that our education here in Latin America is very Eurocentric, as we engage with a lot of European and US authors most of the time. But, as Latin Americans that had also a part of their education in Europe, we also perceive that the way we read and the way we engage with non-Latin American, non American epistemologies come from a Latin American perspective. And some characteristics of this way of engaging with um, non-Latin American epistemologies is bringing it to practice 
And as after my presentation, we'll be discussing a bit about this concept of decoloniality through the Latin American decolonial turn, which is a theoretical a epistemological movement that are built by Latin American scholars. And after that, uh, Juan will present a concept of praxis, also engaging with some different um, scholars to build up this concept. After Juan, we will have Jorge discussing some ideas of putting in practice these concepts of both um, decoloniality and praxis. So, and in the end, we want to talk with you all and discuss all the issues we are bringing and all the concepts we are discussing here and to put it on the table and discuss it with everyone that is here in the ICTM's dialogues with us today. So to start my part of the presentation, as it's going to be very theoretical, I would like to start with um, maybe an example or maybe with uh, the embodiment of some of the ideas I'm trying to expose here. So I'm going to bring, I'm going to show you a video of a carnival parade that happens here in my city, in Porto Alegre, in the south of Brazil, since uh, every year since 2013. And this specific carnival parade, uh, it's very meaningful to me, it's a carnival parade that I really enjoy. And as you're going to see, it is a party, it is a street party, but also that also embodies a lot of political struggles and a lot of political statements. So these ideas of how the body is political and how the ways we see the world or we try to theorize the world also passes through an idea of practice and of transforming the world. So I will start with this example, so let's watch the video. Mítico, misterioso bloco da laje. Nos encontramos nas ruas, nos parques, nas praças da cidade. Com um swing, malemolência, alegria e resistência. Pois a brincadeira é a nossa grande revolução. Watching this video, don't worry that I'm, I'm going to translate the, the words that they, they are saying. So, talking a bit uh, about carnival, right? Carnival is a tradition in Brazilian culture. So, it's part of the construction of Brazilian identity. One of the many things that identify Brazil is as the country of carnival, right? And carnival historically embodies contemporary social and political struggles. So, at the same time, it is a tradition, let's say, it is a tradition that uh, is very much shaped by the contemporary struggles. So it is a party, 
and we have different ways of organizing this party. I think most people know the carnival from Rio de Janeiro, and we have this big parade in, in the Sapucaí, uh, where the schools of samba present their big cars and all the, the fantasies. And it can be only a party, but it can also be a political statement. Even the, the commercial carnival, sometimes they, some of the schools, they make very strong political statements talking about Brazilian history, about uh, the, the role of Black people in Brazilian history, of women, and even sometimes criticizing openly government. So I think last year, because of the pandemic, we didn't have carnival. And I think Bolsonaro probably was very happy because I'm sure that a lot of schools of samba would do a very, a very critical parade. And I think what I want to talk a bit here is how party and how play and how mocking is part of these political statements, right? So in this specific uh, carnival parade, it happened in uh, January, 2020. So just before the pandemic, and sadly, I couldn't be part of it because at this time I was in London finishing my, my master's, finishing Corio Mundus. And it was so sad that this year, 2021, we, it couldn't happen because of a pandemic. It's something I really miss. It's always something that um, this specific carnival parade has a lot of meaning for me because I have a lot of friends that play the instruments there or play the, the players, as they say, like the people that are there. Um, Presenting, performing, let's say, but also enjoying the party. And you see there is a lot of people participating as just like enjoying the party. But the specific parade, we can see it as also a very strong um, political demonstration. So the, the speech that we can see in the beginning of the video, what they are saying is, we meet on the streets, in the parks, in the squares of the city, with swing, with malemolencia, which is a word that I cannot translate to English, is something related to swing, but is not translatable, with joy and with resistance, because to play is our great revolution. Who wants to play? Come and play now. And that's what the song says. Quem quiser brincar, quem quiser que brinca agora. Who wants to play? Come and play now. And in this specific parade, we can see the public space being occupied by playful political bodies. So we can start to see dance and play as a tool for social transformation. And in the specific case of this Bloco da Laje, the, the parade of Bloco da Laje, we call the, the parades blocos. So this one specifically, it shows a collective embodiment of social progressive values, such as feminism, LGBTQ plus causes, anti-racism, all the songs are, are very political in the sense and the performance also and the, play, the way people uh, are occupying this public space for partying, for enjoying themselves. You can see people are very happy and very enjoying the, the situation, but also it is a political statement. So here I, I bring these pictures from their Instagram account is from one of the performances. She's one of the um, people that are, are there performing. And he's saying Jesus is a woman and specifically a black woman. So we're talking about a tradition that comes from Christian, it, it's a Christian party carnival, but is also a very profane party. And we are uh, questioning these hegemonic ideas of what is to be a woman and the, the, the role of a black woman in Brazilian society and in religion, as we are a very religious society. So I, I bring the example of carnival here to start thinking about the, this Latin American perspective of putting this transformation, of the, the society, the, the transformation we want in society through our bodies and also through theorization. And that's how I start to, to think about decolonial theory from the Latin American perspective. So through the Latin American decolonial term. As here, I think I'm, I'm dialoguing a lot with Latin Americans. As I know, ICTN has a lot of people from here, from South America uh, participating, but also Europeans. And here I would like to address mainly uh, our European, uh, the Europeans are here uh, dialoguing with us to show that the coloniality can be think, they can be thought as a 
Latin American epistemology. And we have, if we want to, to think about the coloniality in Europe, we should start to think about bringing people, non-European authors to this discussion. And that's what I'm trying to do here. So here I have a um, definition of coloniality by Walter Mignolo. That is one of uh, the academics that bring, the, bring up the, the colonial theory. So he says, coloniality is the, in the first place, a concept that came into being from the former colonies of South American Andes at the closing of the Cold War, geopolitics of knowing. It brought to light the global consequences of the invention of the Americas for the planetary world order since then. So we are terrorizing from Latin America and thinking Latin America in relation to this globalized world that was a consequence and all the consequences of colonialism. So here I bring us an illustration, uh, a painting by the Uruguayan painter, Joaquin Torres Garcia, that uh, puts this other perspective to think Latin America is our North. So just to um, contextualize a bit, the, the colonial theory, the origins of the colonial tour is turn is the group modernity coloniality from mostly Latin American academics. So we have here some names of this the colonial turn that you can try to find articles about it. We're going to bring the references uh, in the end of the presentation. So we have Nelson Maldonado Torres, Anibal Quejano, Enrique Dussel, Bate Mignolo, Santiago Castro Gomez, Catherine Walsh, and Maria Lugones. Just to quote a bit of these names, they are very important for uh, to think about the colonial theory, and uh, to also to post to, to uh, localize this theory and the influences from post-colonial theory and from Marxist theory. So we have a, a lot of influences from Immanuel Wallerstein from the U.S., the the Indians as Shanti Mohanty or Homi Baba, the Palestinian Edward Said very important thinker for the post-colonial theory, Franz Fanon, Paulo Freire from, from Brazil, Boaventura de Souza Santos from Portugal, and the discussions of the World Social Forum that used to be happening here in Porto Alegre. Sadly, it's been a while that it doesn't happen, but all these ideas were coming together, mainly here, there in the 2000s, where when the World Forum was happening, and all these ideas of the places of the global south in this um, new millennium, let's say. So how does the colonial term define coloniality? And here I think it's very important to make a difference between colonialism and coloniality. So we can start to think about the coloniality, okay? So colonialism, was the political administrative structure in which the authority and sovereignty over a given territory resides in another territory, people, and nation. Colonialism is the historical process that happened in the, the Americas, in Africa, in Asia, and is a given historic fact. It cannot be undone. So colonialism is given. And to think about the coloniality, we first have to think about coloniality. That is, let's say, the heritage of colonialism. So coloniality transcends and constitutes this political administrative structure, being the apparatus of power that articulates the intersubjective relations that refer to authority, work, knowledge, and spirituality of a people who dominate over a people who is dominated. It is one of the constitutive elements of the work pattern of capitalism power, based on the imposition of racial ethnic classification of the world population on the model of sex gender segregation, determining hierarchies of production and enjoyment of the capitalist market, operating in a material and subjective dimensions of everyday existence in a worldwide scale. So here we have a very um, clear definition of what coloniality is, that is how we organize the world, how we classify the world, how both subjectively and objectively. So the, the way we classify knowledge, we hierarchize the production of knowledge, how we hierarchize countries as developed countries and developing countries, this is all um, a consequence of colonialism as defined by the decolonial turn. So if coloniality refers to the continuity of 
colonial forms of domination after the end of colonial administrations produced by colonial cultures and structures in the modern colonial capitalist patriarchal system. If coloniality is that, the coloniality then is start to think how to transform this structure given by coloniality. So if by coloniality we mean the underlying logic common to all Western colonialisms and therefore the darker side of modernity, the coloniality means both the analytic of such underlying logic rather than the historical socioeconomic analysis of colonization. So we are starting to, to think about this structure that is still here, that is still part of our lives, that is determining the fact that I'm here speaking in English and that my native language is Portuguese and I'm a Brazilian person. And so this is all um, consequences of what happened in the past that was colonialism. So if coloniality is a structure, therefore decolonization is a collective effort. So here we start to think about how we can decolonize things. So if we start to think coloniality as a structure, we have to start to think also that we can only decolonize things, not as only an individual effort, but as a social, a social effort for transforming the world. So, if the coloniality is the process and the project of building, shaping, and enabling coloniality otherwise, interculturality, as defined by social movements in Abiy Ayala, is both a complementary political, epistemic, and existence based project and instrument and tool of the coloniality practice. And just to clarify, Abiy Ayala means, in the language of the Kuna people from the Colombian Andes, a land that is alive is a synonym of the land they inhabit. So it is a way also to try to rename this land we are now inhabiting. And as America was the name that the Europeans gave to this continent. So by naming it Abiy Ayala, we are also reclaiming it and reclaiming the indigenous knowledge and the indigenous epistemics and the indigenous name way of classifying and naming things. So through this perspective, uh, interculturality is an important tool for decolonization as it is a praxis. And now I will pass the word to Juan that will explain this concept of praxis and its relation to the colonial theory and to the ways we are thinking decoloniality. Okay, so I would like to uh, talk about this concept of uh, praxis and decolonization. Maybe we can start with the next slide. This painting is very powerful. It's, um, it represents the condor, an, an animal in the Andes, and the bull, which the uh, Andean people associated mostly with Spaniards. So the question is, how do these two relate, right? Uh, in, it was a, a brutal celebration, Yawar Fiesta, where the, the condor used to ride the bull. And for, for the Andean people, this meant victory. But this is not the way we construe of uh, decolonization or decoloniality, right? Uh, we have to accept that certain historical processes have happened without justifying them, without denying the fact that they were brutal. But here we are. So the question is, how do we go on from here? <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> OK, so um, Nayara has given a, a very clear um, exposition about what decoloniality is and colonization and how we can associate this. And I would like just to summarize quickly uh, some of the things that we associate colonization with, right? So as Nayara said, we have a, a sort of codification. So, okay, uh, you have codification by color, for example, right? Uh, white, uh, the black, the oranges maybe that are the, the Indians. Uh, and of course, this codification also belongs to um, uh, privileges uh, regarding owning land or the kind of work that you do, how you are perceived in society. Um, if you're if you are perceived as uh, you know, it's it's nicer to be white, right, in this uh, colonial standard than it is to be black and to be Indian. To the kind of freedom that you have, right, the autonomy or uh, being a slave or or being in practice a slave, even though you are not officially that, right. Um, another very important 
thing are hierarchies, <coughs> the kind of hierarchy that we find in epistemology, for example, between subject and object, right? The object is always uh, inspected, acted upon by an all-knowing subject that can also contemplate sometimes the object, and we find this in aesthetics, right? The notion of pure contemplation, like from the eye of God, um, and we also associate uh, colonization with discrimination, marginalization, inv invisibilization, violence, right? Against uh, different other that is considered to be inferior due to the hierarchical view. Uh, and we also associate colonization with uh, Eurocentrism in knowledge, right? For the, the view that science is the best, and perhaps for, for some, and I've heard this, it is the only kind of knowledge there actually is, right? And uh, well, uh, mythologies or practical knowledge or also uh, known as know-how today, it's really not knowledge or in what sense it is, you know, it's hard to accept it. Um, others will say that colonization is also tied to the dynamics of this civilized capitalism, right? So any, any society or any, any community that doesn't function by capitalist standards and um, does not comply with its measures, uh, then it, it can't be said to be civilized. They are, they, they are left behind in time, right? So colonization is associated with all of these things. And often decolonization is associated with going against all of these things. There, uh, there, the list could be even longer, but this is sort of the, base, the basic idea. So praxis and decolonization, why should we care about praxis and how is it connected to decolonization? Well, um, we actually need positive concepts to support uh, decolonizing motion because decolonizing is broad enough, right? And one such positive concept that is an assertive concept that is saying this is what we should do or this is what is implied if we are going to carry out the, the decolonization project or the decoloniality project is praxis. So decolonizing points towards transforming the world for the better given a colonial matrix. Uh, this is at, at least the way I understand it from this Latin American perspective that Nayara was pointing at. And uh, praxis is a disposition to transform our situated reality, reflecting always, right? Reflecting our actions, but acting and engaging with others and engaging with the world. So this is sort of, I'm giving you the spoiler here. I will justify these ideas later on, but I would like uh, at least to enunciate what, why practice connect, uh, praxis connects with decolonization. So praxis as a reflexive action is going beyond the classic body-mind division that uh, we often complain about. That is because, as I will show, there is, um, there is a mindfulness to, practi to praxis and there is theory applied in praxis. So praxis as a disposition suggests an agency, a capacity of transforming things that goes beyond undoing, beyond wanting to go behind to some sort of ideal past, and even beyond reaching a specific goal. That, that is what disposition refers to. And a pragmatism in our view will allow us to construe knowledge differently, right? So knowledge is not about just uh, enunciating or discovering or contemplating truths about the world, pleasant as that might be, but knowledge is praxis, right? Knowledge is uh, always as some sort of doing and therefore praxis is knowledge. So um, I, would like to, I would like to go back to Aristotle here because he is one of the, one of the key proponents of the concept of praxis. And this is part of the decolonial um, approach, right? So is, uh, Aristotle is a white uh, European male <laughs> that dominated much of knowledge for many centuries, uh, but that is no reason to discard him as long as he has something useful to say. And he does, actually. I do believe that he does. Because he, he compares praxis with another concept, poiesis. So poiesis refers to a productive activity. And uh, for example, when I want to build a house, we say, okay, uh, building the house is something that I do, but in the end, I do have an end. I want to have a house, right? I want to have a finished house. So then poiesis is, as a productive activity is going to be efficiency driven, right? So of course, uh, if I'm going to build a house, I want to spare the materials. I want to reduce the time that I invest in building the house because what I want to have is the house. And this means that poiesis uh, finishes once the end and namely having a finished house is achieved, right? 
And in this sense, as a realization, it is a one-time thing, right? This is the way we think about Boyesi. Praxis, instead, Aristotle thinks uh, about it as reflex, reflexive practical action, right? So in this case, the end is embedded in the action. Let us put the, the case that we like to dance salsa, right? So uh, if, we, if we tried uh, that wanting to dance salsa, liking to dance salsa, this is, this is praxis. Why? Because I feel like dancing salsa. So when I dance, when I am dancing, I am enjoying the dancing, right? In that case, the end is not different from what I'm doing, but the end is embedded in the action itself. It would be silly to say, I want to be very efficient about dancing salsa and do it as fast as possible because I want to dance salsa, right? No, <laughs> I mean, I wanted to dance salsa and that's why I am dancing now. So the temporality of practice is different. Uh, and in this sense, the end of, of praxis, the wish to dance, is, um, is not limiting the activity itself, right? So it is part of the activity. And that also implies that praxis is experience-driven. So we enjoy the experience of what we're doing. And we have this disposition to do it. That means that given certain conditions, uh, we will want to dance, we will manifest our dancing. And even if the conditions are not there, we will create those conditions in order to be able to dance. If I like dancing salsa, but I'm not in a salsa studio at, at some point, maybe I'm dancing in the bus stop, right? I find a way to make it happen because we have the need to dance. Uh, so so th this is a very important a contrast. And maybe the key idea that I would like to emphasize here is on praxis as a disposition. Okay, very well. So um, Freire, besides Aristotle, Freire also brings uh, this concept of praxis in a Latin American context. But I'm calling this Freire Reloaded because uh, we're adapting his theory a little bit. For Freire, there is a difference between in the oppressed and the oppressors, right? And uh, well, he says praxis has to bring a world transformation uh, that liberates first the oppressed, and this transformation is going to be um, performed by the oppressed themselves, and then in turn they will liberate the oppressors, right? But how do we identify, like today, maybe during colonial times, it was easier to think, okay, you have a group of people that are being subjected, in our case, by the Spaniards, and then they want to liberate and liberate themselves and fight back. But, uh, and, and then you could think, okay, so then you have these that are oppressed, these that are the oppressors. But even during colonial times, the dynamics were much more complex than that, right? Uh, for example, in the case of Indians that are supporting the Spaniards. Uh, and today it's even more complicated. In the case of Peru, uh, now we have two, we are, in, we, we, we are celebrating the Bicentenario, right? 200 years after the supposed independence of, from the colonial regime. So uh, we should acknowledge actually that each one of us is occupying a position. We're situated in, an, in a matrix of oppression. And this big matrix exceeds any individual effort. Of course, there are people that exert the role of oppressors, but um, each one of us is positioned and we might be positioned as an oppressor or not uh, <clears throat> in a given perspective. For example, uh, I heard of a, of a gay man that was from the left uh, wing, uh, right, and during the 70s, and he couldn't belong to the Marxist party because the Marxists that were very occupied transforming the world for the better, they would reject him because he was gay, right? So this is, a, this is the form of um, occupying different positions in this matrix. Um, so we should be aware, says Freire, that the oppressing reality is sort of a force of immersion of consciousness. It just sticks us uh, to the world. When there is no distance to the world, to the reality we live in, then no real transformation is possible. So then uh, the goal for uh, today has to go beyond humanization. Humanization is the, the concept that Freire proposed, but it's a bit anthropocentric. So we have to think about the liberation of human beings in relation to each other, in relation to other beings or species, in relation to our world, right? If not, we end up in the kind of ecological crisis that we are facing today. So then praxis can be understood as reflection and action of humans upon the world in order to transform it. So this is consistent with Aristotle's view. And if we are to achieve liberation, then the oppressed must discover that they host the oppressor inside. Um, uh, we need to develop a critical consciousness about this reality. We need to take some sort of distance from it. 
uh, we need to discover or rediscover the kind of reality we are immersed in, right? And we need to also exercise a compromise, the disposition that Aristotle was, uh, was talking about, but the, the word compromiso is very strong in Spanish. It's a very strong commitment to a cause, right? Knowing that you're going to have to struggle for this, and you're going to have to luchar. Luchar is a, is a word that is very present in, in discourses of transformation in Spanish. And Freire will enunciate a very important principle uh, that Marx uh, enunciated himself, and it is the oppressed engage in their own liberation, right? You have uh, the principle of immanence in Spinoza, you have it in Hegel, you have it in Marx, and the Latin Americas will embrace this. Someone cannot come from outside and liberate someone else. Liberation, transformation happens from the inside, right? Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> So another very important contribution that Freire brings is like his very um, integrative way of construing uh, the interaction between subjective and objective relation. Uh, a subject in a world, <coughs> we are engaged in sub a way, we have a perception of this world, we have feelings about it, affects about the world and the reality that we're living in. This is the subjective dimension but we're also in, engaged in objective relations. I mean, you have a job, right? You do stuff in the world, you sort of act inside it, maybe not transforming it, but you're acting inside the world, right? So, um, and, and Freire says, okay, let us imagine that you say, oh, I don't know, I'm going to invent my own reality, right? I'm going to invent my own reality. And this is like, I will, dis I will disconnect from what actually is happening. And I will go as far with this project as I can. You will soon face the wall and, you know, get hit in the face because you will be purely the domain of imagination of the, as the figure is showing, right? So uh, you can rely on imagination. The opposite extreme along the subjective dimension would, would say, I don't need to imagine anything, you know? I'm just in the world. I'm just, you know, chilling, living inside it, eh, doing what I have to do to, in order to survive. The world is what it is. I mean, why do you want to change it? It's okay to be here, right? Um, the other dimension would be the objective dimension. And sometimes when we want to fit in the world, we say, okay, I want to have a nice job. I want the car. I want the house. I want, you know, all of these classical measures of, of success, of fitting very well inside the world that lead us to some sort of comfort situation of well-being right? and it's not that this is a problem per se but sometimes we can become so engaged that we don't actually realize what is becoming in our lives or maybe we even become slaves of, the, of this world right we're running like a hamster inside a little wheel and we and we don't even notice it so opposed to that of course you have situations of poverty of not having a job of struggling in order to i don't know to act of being in prison is an, an example where your acting capacities are limited, right? Your liberty, your capacity to, to affect the world is limited. So in this sense, uh, praxis comes as a very special concept and the arrow is pointing upwards because it says, yes, you need to have an imagination. You need to have a critical consciousness. And that means that you're taking a distance from reality, yeah? So you have to be both immersed in reality in order to transform it, but you have to look at this reality with fresh eyes, right? Or not only the eyes, right? With a fresh body, with fresh affects, with, you know, discover it anew, uh, to mirarla con extrañeza, right? To, to, to look, look at it like, hmm, what is this? How can this be, right? Like with a certain surprise. And this will allow us, combined with action, which uh, exerts objective transformation on the world, to exert practice. So we need the subjective and the objective dimension. Next slide, please. And here comes Victoria Santa Cruz. Victoria is a great figure from the Afro-Peruvian revival movement. She's a choreographer, um, a thinker, a transformer. She, she not only did very much um, to propound uh, some sort of Afro-Peruvian pride in Peru and to create many dances and, and to direct many important uh, dance companies in Peru. But she also has this very interesting book, which is called uh, Rhythm, the Great Organizer, Ritmo el Eterno Organizador. And here she talks about action as something central. For her. And she says, action belongs to the present. 
it is ever becoming. But she talks uh, about rhythm as a great organizer because for her, action can only be understood inside rhythm. And as something rhythmic, it is precise. It is timely, right? So when you're playing with a band, for example, uh, maybe you're doing this very simple bell pattern. Ta, 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 ta. But if you miss the timing there and you're the bell, so even someone that is not trained in music will hear this, right? Why? Because you have to be timely, you have to be precise, you have to be balanced, and you have to listen, right? The whole band has to listen to each other. And this is the way she suggests that we should operate inside the world, right? If, you, if we don't do this, then we have reaction, disconnection. So for her, action unifies. Action creates unities within unities within unity. And therefore, action is non-eliminational. It's not like when you face a problem, you just go and you just do, 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 do. You know, that's not the kind of approach, but it's integrational. It's discovering. She says, si no puedes contra el enemigo, únete a él. Yeah? So if you can't, uh, if you can't win against your enemy, then join the enemy. Find how to relate to the enemy and become a greater unity, right? Something different than what you were before this experience. And because of this, because um, action is based on our life experiences, action is situated and it responds to a specific context. Once again, just as Freire, she's going to be very emphatic about immanence. That is, for her, the greatest battles comes from the inside. That doesn't mean that we live in the pure subjective dimension. That means that I can't ask others what I am not capable of doing myself, and that if we are committing to decolonization, we need to embrace it practicing. We, we have to be agents in favor of decolonization, right? And if we are going to play music and be good dancers, we need to train, right? So this transformation has to start, and this applies to communities as well, right? It's again the principle nobody can come from outside and free you. Liberation has, has to come from a community force. So, so far, we, we, have talked about, uh, we have talked about Aristotle, we have talked about Freire and Victoria Santa Cruz, and each one of them is giving us something to think about uh, when it comes to, to action and to praxis. And here we also have uh, cognitive science and uh, philosophy of mind. And they tell, well, what is the structure of intentional election? This figure maybe looks a little bit messy, but I would like you to emphasize on the fact that you have loops. And these loops are like circles, right? And you have a loop of having an intention, having something that you want to do, then having to make decisions as to how to do that. Then you execute those decisions and that execution is actually an action. And this action operates over the world. It transforms the world. But then you very importantly have to have a perception of how your action modified the world. Yeah? And you also have to have a perception, an active perception about how the world is. And so if, if any of these components fails, then you achieve this sort of imbalance that Victoria is talking about. right? And very importantly, our perceptions of what we are doing, of how we took decisions, of how we ex executed the decisions, of how we are comparing what the reality that we want with the reality that we achieved by means of our action, all of these things have to influence as well how we form our intentions, what we think that we should be doing, right? So um, it would take a lot of time maybe to explain this, and this is even a simplified version of how we humans operate, but this is very important because, uh, okay, to talk praxis, reflexive action, reflexive action, well, this is going deeper into the nature of action. So again, I would like you to stick to some keywords, our intentions of action. What is it that we commit to do? How we make decisions given that we have that desire, right? Okay, what, if, if I want to do this, then I have to decide what to do. Here is where knowledge intervenes, right? Knowledge of previous situations, uh, knowledge that maybe you have memorized, knowledge um, from previous experiences in life, right? So knowledge here is actively integrated in the decision-making, uh, in our execution, okay, what is the best action? How do I select the action that I want to do? What is the commands that I give to myself in order to perform an action, right? And then, okay, we act on the world, the world gets transformed, then we need some sort of feedback. We need to know, okay, so what happened? You know, I did this, and how did that impact the reality? And it's, uh, you know, it's as basic as when you want to prepare juice, 
maybe you you mix some fruit, you add some sugar, but even if you have a fixed sugar measure, you don't know how sweet the sugar that you bought is. So you need to taste the juice. You have perception here. And my my colleague and friend Jorge is going to explain the important role of perception in, in decolonization, right? So we have all of these key components that are formed in loops, in circles. And so action and praxis, therefore, is a very complex thing. Now I'm ready to close up. Mm. So there is, I have, I believe in big pictures. I know that in papers, usually you try to deliver one idea and argue thoroughly for it. I, I'm, I, sometimes that is necessary, but sometimes you need to say, okay, you just unpack. And there's a lot of stuff to think about and, and that we can dwell deeper on. But so far we've said that practice is situated, reflexive, transformational, tunable, right? Ad adjustable and deeply connected to others, other human beings, um, to other species and to the world. Praxis, we have said, involves subjective and objective relations to the world. It's not just imagining a different reality, but it is engaging in transforming the, the actual reality that we have. Uh, praxis belongs to the present, right? But even though we are marked by our memories, we are marked by our intentions, and that is by our projection to the future, right? And praxis is complex. Uh, when we action is a form of praxis, right? Action in the intentional action that is in the cognitive science sense, we have perceptions, we have decisions, we have the how we act or how we implement those decisions, our criteria to judge what we did, our memories, our associations, our habits. There are many things that are playing an important role. And praxis, then, uh, I am incisive on this, implies transformation, and therefore. We have this integrational struggle, the la lucha that uh, Victoria is talking about and that Freire talks about too, right? We're going to struggle. It's not going to come for, for free. The world, the colonial matrix makes a resistance. And that is why we need to, we would need to work as a community, right? We need to form communities. For me, uh, there is so much focus on individualism today that we're forgetting the importance of community. And uh, I, I, I think that we all in this group believe that pragmatism uh, that is the approach, the view that knowledge is integrated in praxis, that action is the best way for us to understand the world today and our relation with the world today. Um, and this has the advantage of integrating very nicely, for example, with other cultures where they know how to do stuff, right? They know how to do things and maybe they have, uh, we know that in some cultures, things are ex best explained by means of mythology and not necessarily by a systematic scientific enunciation of propositions, right? But we, we can value their sort of doing and their sort of actions and their systems of actions if we embrace this pragmatic approach. Very importantly, practice is a disposition. That means that we have to enjoy the experience of doing it. It is a commitment. It is not like, okay, I am like this expression, I'm going to decolonize myself. When are you ever done with that, right? I would rather call that like an individual practice. I train. We train because we believe there is transformation to be done, so we train, right? We train to, uh, to get as far as there is matrix as possible, to, to play to the other side of the matrix, uh, to transform it, right? Um, and basically, the connection between practice and decolonization is there is no decolonization without practice, just pure and simple. Nayara has given a very nice example of the carnival as an action, a collective action of intervening and creating a common space. Jorge is going to delve deeper about how we perceive others and how this is also shaped by the colonial legacy. And Majo is going to talk about how knowledge is situated, right? How it is specific. It is different to theorize from your desk than theorizing from your fieldwork experience, then theorizing from your fieldwork experience, given that you live there and that you can't exit that reality. It is different, right? So all of these conditions impact knowledge and very importantly, the fact that doing is knowledge or knowledge can be construed as something that you do. Uh, so these were the key ideas that I wanted to share. And finally, I, I have uh, two very short examples that I would like to share. This is where we stand in decolonization. One of my one of my colleagues, you know, from my years in the university, shared the image in the left. You see, the man that you see there is President President Castillo, recently elected, being compared with a dog hanging somewhere, uh, so like stupid. Like, how did they arrive there? They asked. The car trapped in the trees, 
the horse trapped in between a fence and the president, you know, <laughs> with, a, with a presidential band. Yeah? So, of course, this is very racist because I have never seen such propaganda with any white presidents or even with the Chinese or Japanese president that we had with Fujimori, right? And then Castillo, in his, um, in his first discourse, in his first message to the nation, uh, he invited the king of Spain and he mentioned colonization, yeah, that Peru had been a colonized nation. And he was heavily criticized for being ignorant and stupid. And they say that uh, in Spain answers, replies to Castillo. And uh, the, the, the third guy that you're seeing in the, in the picture, he says, but Castillo, you're wearing a hat and that comes from Spain. And besides Spain, did, uh, they are not mentioning how barbarians the, the indigenous people were doing all these rituals with sacrifices. So you, you see that you still have this discourse of sort of, we came and saved you, right? <laughs> we taught you God, we taught you Spanish and you're wearing a hat. Of course, we can accept that there was a cultural exchange. But that does not deny that it was a brutal, unfair, um, dominative kind of relation during colony. So whether it is appropriate to mention it in your discourse, given that you invited the king of Spain, is a different matter. But the fact and the interesting thing to see here as anthropologists is what, what sort of reaction this causes. And the reaction is not only among Peruvians, and many criticize him for being uh, ignorant or old, but also between Spaniards, right? So Spain as a part of Europe where this decolonization discourse is arising is also uh, with this kind of colonial mentality still. So it's no, it is good to know where we stand. But if we go to the next one, we have a little bit of hope, right? Um, and, and here we're going to see, you know, so uh, we, we've seen this kind of reaction to Castillo's uh, message. But for example, here we have some of our Peruvian women that are, uh, rendering a homage to Victoria Santa Cruz, right? And they are not only doing that, but they are also like making theirs a poem as some sort of theater, theatrical poem that Victoria wrote many years ago called Me Gritaron Negra, they yelled black at me. So let us listen to them, let us uh, see them dance and perform. Y así me atrevo a decir que el hombre negro y la mujer negra nunca fueron esclavos porque no pudieron esclavizar su ritmo interior, que es su libertad. Y nadie le puede quitar la libertad al otro porque esa vive dentro de uno mismo y solo uno se la puede quitar. The kind of concept we are aiming for is not a concept that has to be translated into a body afterwards or a concept that inspires a movement later. We are in that sense not only thinking about a concept of decoloniality but trying to act it out, letting it be engendered in its kinetic and corporeal sense. We subscribe to the view that modernity implies coloniality and that coloniality implies moder modernity. Since colonialism is over while coloniality is pervasive, decolonizing is not about undoing colonization, but about overcoming the remaining structures of coloniality. Colonialism is over, but coloniality is all over, as Mignolo would remark. We do not claim or pursue the return of a pristine past, of non-interference nor a romantic purity of our cultures, 
but rather a tilt in the current priorities, hierarchies, and preferences that either ratify or put in tension the colonial heritage of race casteism and the westernization of daily life in the global south. At the same time, we recognize the harmful consequences of isolated nationalisms, not only for the failure of national states and liberal democracies, but also for the horrendous traces of renewed radicalisms against external influences, as seen with the Hindu chauvinism or ISIS. On the contrary, we aim for pluralism or a pluriversality that recognizes historic and current asymmetries in the free market of ideas, academia, and daily life. We are looking past beyond the mere invocation of multiculturalism as the multipurpose solution that might ratify or even accelerate previous inequalities. We do acknowledge that the western westernization of public policies, economy, and foreign affairs relates to a set of choices that belong to a government, but we are convinced that it is within our own field of agency to decolonize the relationships, choices, and practices of our quotidian. Aníbal Quijano mentioned that it is a lost battle to decolonize the state. Should we think extensively in those terms about academia? Our modernity, modernities or postmodernities are malleable and plastic. However, we cannot think about decoloniality only in rational terms because somehow that would ratify inadvertently the Western canon of the order of, per of perception below the order of ideas. In this sense, how do our bodies fit within the decolonizing endeavor? Can our corporal realities only be referred to, or can they become a decolonizing agent? If, for example, to understand the Zapatista movement, I described it based on Bourdieu or in the sociological methods, then I only reproduce the epistemic colonization that denies the possibility of the socio-historic situation of Latin America to be described according to the thought produced by the Latin American Zapatistas themselves, and it would render it as less relevant than the reflections that Habermas has developed, according to Mignolo and Walsh. Similarly, to only think or theoretically reflect on how coloniality has impacted our bodies would relegate our corporeal order to a secondary place, always unable to speak for itself. Therefore, some of the words that I will be pronouncing here are aimed to produce a somatic reaction in those who are attending, since to decolonize our university departments or syllaba requires more than just adding more melanin in our teams. We have to start tracing where coloniality is or was felt in our bodily experiences, or digito carnalidades, as Citro will say. Have you felt shrinking in the middle of a classroom full of international students because it seemed like you were the one with the most notorious accent while speaking English? <sighs> Even more personal and more somatic. Have you felt invisible at the gay bar, seeing your white friends getting more attention and being better received than you as a person of color? <sighs> Do people in your household still buy whitening soap? Did you ever receive comments from your parents telling you to avoid the sun to not darken your skin? <sighs> Have you, as a dancer of, of color, been confined to traditional dance because you look not white? Has your work been mistakenly categorized as ethnic dance only because you are VPOC? <sighs> Have you been asked to perform or dance at a public event of white institutions because it would look cool and add a multicultural value to it, yet the only people who got to talk were white folks? <sighs> How did that feel? How did that change your bodily posture? or the openness of your chest, or the verticality of your spine. 
but I am very woke and we even have a non-white person hired in our department. Is there more to do to the colonized space? The university was and is part of the global designs of the modern colonial world. I want to say that the educational institution that was conceived in terms of the university was consubstantial in the epistemic conceptualization that we know today as universality. The religious and economic expansion of the West paralleled the expansion of the university. Consequently, the situation of the university in this plane must be thought of in relation to the planetary distribution of economic wealth. But in addition, it must also be seen in relation to the devaluation of education in global neoliberal designs parallel to the devaluation of human life, according to Walter McNulloch. Where is your desk at the faculty built on? How traditional or indigenous cultures has propelled you career as an academic and are you willing to see those dynamics? Those who work in the United States and benefit from critical thinking or corporeal practices produced in Africa, Asia, or Latin America have an important role supporting politically, intellectually, materially those thinking and dancing outside of the States or Europe, according to Mignolo and Walsh. How can we effectively make room in academia for relegated voices and bodies of the indigenous, the mestiza, and the marginalized? Are you about to pass the mic? Then maybe you shouldn't have had it in the first place. Otherwise, people wouldn't be waiting for you to pass it on. Pass the mic, but allow for others to disconnect, unplug, or throw the mic. Are you an international student? Take the mic and speak up. You might have a good point to share, but also you will be shattering the notion that only those who speak well or speak good English are entitled to be heard. The micropolitics of the classroom matter a lot. Are you waiting for people to pass the mic? Do not essentialize the other and think that only subalterns need to speak up. There are indeed decolonial ideas worth being heard of coming from everywhere. Are you demanding from your colleagues to pass the mic? Be intersectional in your approach, please. Don't be a man with multiple institutional affiliations silencing your, silencing your women and migrant colleagues for the sake of them passing the mic. Sometimes they don't need you to pass the mic. You just need to start listening. Don't pass the mic to continue with your savior complex, whereby people are finally speaking thanks to you and your altruism. There is a risk of othering others to ratify yourself as the neutral force blended into the background that pulls the strings on the front. Pass the mic because you want to get to know about other epistemological approaches and ethical stances. Do it because they have something to be shared. Get interested, inspired, and listen. Following up on the them, do you have a paper about them? Would you co-author it with them? Or are they only worthy as objects for you to describe? We cannot sit and wait until academia starts validating oral epistemologies. In the meantime, alter and change the dynamics of who gets published, referenced, and discussed. Who knows, your informant might want to become a PhD too. Finally, has this whole cycle of decolonizing dialogues left you with the sensation that everything is broken and there's nothing you can do to decolonize your field or, or your working space? Here are some small but powerful ideas. Next time you quote them, or use their dances, or refer to them, name them. 
the ratification of Western authors as creators of discrete works versus traditional creations as works made by whole and anonymous communities has to end. Why? Because when we finally choose to turn to them, we will need to know their names. This is to actually take the decolonial choice and allow for others in the future to do so. Allow for indigenous, traditional creators, dancers and thinkers to tangibilize their knowledge systems within academic spaces. Why do we have so many Western authors celebrated for knowing about traditional knowledge systems, yet we do not foreground the bearers of the practices behind them? Contamine your bibliographic references at the end of your paper. We all know that Habermas and Bourdieu look wonderful at the end of your paper, but we need to start altering the circulation of authors, ideas, and perspectives. Let your students know about decoloniality. They are indeed craving it. Next time you speak about abstract painting, don't start with Kandinsky, bring it back to Hilma Afklind and the Islamic tradition of non-representational art. Stop going to remote places and then reporting the experience using Foucault. You are ratifying over and over again the idea that some people are worthy of observation but not actual counterparties in knowledge production. If you are going to speak about them, use an author that belongs to that group or community. Is he, she, or them not published yet? Maybe your thesis can be the first space for them to speak up. Stop saying Marina Avramovic was inspired in ancient cultures to do this rice counting exercise, or based on ancient practices, Eugenio Barba this or that technique. Why starting with the individuating or subjectivifying process only when it shifts to European artists or institutions? From whom did they learn those practices in particular? Which master taught, taught them, named them? Lastly, do not bring a postmodern or post-structuralist approach to dismantle or shatter identities only because you are thinking past beyond them. Black and brown people don't get to claim random identity markers in daily life according to their current mood or trend. Instead of abolishing the value of identity markers to understand the micropolitics of daily life, position yourself, assess yourself, and start owning it. So, um, migration always come, brings to the fore certain differences from our identities and certain particularities of our identities. But migration between academic spaces also brings to the fore certain um, differences in terms of how we approach reality and how we understand life and the phenomena that we are researching. So the following video is a production uh, made from this question and uh, we want to share it here to uh, enrich our discussions about this. Translations. The violence of translation implies in the constant demand for explanation about the experiences of the oppressor's power in our bodies. It happens in silence in the small letter of academia. How many proofs do the powerful need to see what they don't want to see?
What do feminine bodies that are not from here know? So from the topics that we have been discussing, um, we have reached the point in which we think the colonizing therefore means to change and revise the way we see and interact with, with each other. So um, knowing that colonialism led, left a mark in our region in which um, some thoughts are more validated than others, more legitimized, then we need to uh, break with that and start horizontalizing uh, the way we interact and the way we relate with each other and the different perspectives that build and compose our region, that are part of our region uh and are part of the world mainly so we have been uh discussing the topic of or the concept of pluriverse and the concept of good living both are from for example silvia rivera Cusicanqui refers also to this and also some others some other authors as a sandoval forero which is a uh, Latin American um, author as well. And he discusses interculturality in terms of how we have hierarchized the, the knowledge. And we think we have been inclusive by bringing these other groups into the, into the formal education system. But we have not um implemented or included their ways of thinking into this general or main main um education system so we we have been discussing on how we one mark of the colonial thought in our experiences in our practice is how we approach this other uh, knowledge from from a perspective that uh, puts them aside because they don't follow certain rules that are um, created in the in the centers that have the most power for stating the rules of of knowledge production. So we have been trying to imagine an academia with a pluriverse, uh, that it, it doesn't have a university, but a pluriversity, uh, an academia that can uh, approach these different uh, kinds of knowledge from different perspectives, and an academia in which um, our view of others is relativized or yeah, made, made relative to, to to a certain extent, and an academia in which the rules for generation of knowledge change or adjust to different perspectives brought by different human groups and different cultures. And so we, we can access a horizontal system in which everybody has the same access to the mic or have the same access or the same possibility to express an opinion and to express a perspective and an approach, a different approach to, to knowledge. So as in social sciences and cultural studies, dialogue is one of the main points and the main ways in which we generate knowledge. We think we need to start uh, modifying our academias in order to include these other thoughts and this other approach to knowledge and these other perspectives and try the the practical part would be to 
um, allow diversity in our in our research centers, in our research practices, in our practice in our researches themselves, uh, in our particular um, approaches, so that we can generate a pluriverse of of thinking. And we would like you to come into this question and imagine with us how would it be to to have a pluriversity uh, for the production of knowledge and how would it be to change our rules in order to integrate these other um, approaches to knowledge coming from afro diasporic uh, populations from indigenous knowledge and others and that they have the same approach or the same i mean the same possibility to to exchange their knowledge with with us as researchers finally as we have seen a uh, theory and practice are porous they exchange with each other and build each other and uh generating theory and generating thinking itself brings to the fore certain small actions that build knowledge every day. In this sense, um, we finally are wondering how the embodied knowledge enters the discussions of decoloniality. First of all, embodiment as a concept is maybe something that indigenous thought and indigenous epistemologies had clear very long ago. So <clears throat> let's just be clear that this uh, perspective that is maybe a uh, trend now in academia and mainly for the study of music and dance has been there in, in the indigenous thinking from a long time ago. Just now we are approaching from an academic, from, from an academic space. So we would like to think about how do we think about practice and about embodied knowledge? How do we open our academias for those other knowledges that are embodied or carried in our bodies and are not centered in texts or uh, in, in, in the ways in which we have presented the results of our research over the last few years? And how do we open space for these other presentations of results or this other sharing of knowledge? So finally, we would like to bring to the fore as well the situations visited in the video in which our approach to research itself has a cultural background <clears throat> and under a local and situated understanding how the concepts are embodied uh, differently in each location and in the situation and the academic culture that surrounds us as academics and as people interested in music and dance studies. So finally, we would like to uh, discuss a little bit of this. We have been visiting Diana Taylor's The Archive and the Repertoire Concepts and we would like to bring them here also to this discussion, trying to point at how the repertoire and how the knowledge that has been carried out in our bodies is also a valid knowledge and how do we bring those to the research um, centers and to the research spaces, mainly in the study of music and dance. How do we approach them? How do we open our structures for this other <clears throat> kind of knowledge <clears throat> and how do we exchange the categories of informant and researcher in an artist in the way we study this uh, the rhythms and the practices related to dance and music <clears throat> so finally we would like to bring this uh, question to this table and discuss how um, the, the practices themselves are knowledge and how are, are we 
modifying the academic structures to bring them into our research and into our discussions and the elaboration of um, knowledge and the generation of knowledge from <clears throat> from the practicants themselves. So with these reflections, we bring our presentation to an end. This is our bibliography. And this is our contact. So if you want to get in touch with us, you can email us. And now we really much would like to hear everyone that is here present now with us and hear some ideas. And with the time we have left, we would like very much to engage in a discussion about the issues we brought up. So please, any questions, any comments, any observations, please, the table is open now. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, friends and colleagues, for listening, for attending, and for your time. And now we are approaching the last portion of today's session, which is engaging, as Nayara mentioned, in this dialogue, this chat with you, and maybe to give you just a couple of moments to put together your question, either, either if you want to put it on the chat box or to just uh, straight up open up your microphone. We will start by yourself saying one very quick round of comments among us, and then we can jump in with a larger audience in a kind of cross-pollinating um, angle. So I'm going to start with Nayara. So thank you very much, Jorge. Uh, I don't think I have anything to add. I'm just uh, very much uh, anxious and excited about this discussion right now. So uh, thank you very much for everyone that is being present here. There are a lot of people that I really admire, uh, which work I really admire. I would like also to say that I really, uh, I'm very honored by the presence of Professor Adra here, because as an Oriental dancer, Oriental dance researcher, I really much your work. So thank you very much for everyone that is present, people that uh, I already know from other encounters. So thank you very much. Wonderful. And then I'm going to go ahead with Juan. Well, just to drop a provocational question, uh, uh, it would be what is peer about peer review? That would be my sort of <laughs> my sort of question to provoke. And of course, we are expecting your questions actually to engage or opinions or comments. <clears throat> Thank you, Juan. And from my side, I was just by listening to my colleagues, I just thought, um, I was wondering how decolonial thought overlaps with other struggles or other perspectives, for example, academic um, perspectives as Maho Westman. And with the practice as research, putting intention the, uh, uh, the 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 way in which knowledge is produced and so i'm thinking on how the maneuver corporealism universalisms um in the politics behind the circulation of authors of papers and the very modes or platforms for them to even be tangibilized or palpable for us um, that was my perspective, and I would love to hear what the rest of the audience thinks about that. And then I'm going to close this short round with Maho. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your comments. I just want to tell Jorge that you like cut a little bit with your connection, so maybe you can put your comment and question in the chat so that we can just go on from there. And I... I was thinking during the during the video about all our conversations, and I was thinking how we are living in strange, strange times now, and we are going through like a world crisis. And in within this crisis, we have seen in our region like a lot of tearing down the statues or uh, external signs of colonial times. Uh, so I was thinking, what would be for academia the tearing down of the colonial structures? So that's my provoking question. And thinking about how 
uh, decolonial is also a situated term. And what would be the next steps over that for each region? Thank you very much. Wonderful. So we hope that somehow those questions will trigger some reactions some comments from you, all of you. And so please feel free to use either the raise your hand option here on Zoom or the chat box or directly opening up your microphone. I hope I'm not lagging. I'm not, my voice is being heard clearly, but please go ahead. Liz, you here. Okay, well, thank you so much for your nice, very, very nice presentation. I just to comment a, a couple of things. Uh, I, I was amazing with the collective uh, articulation. I don't know if the is the word, uh, how um, you can uh, make a collective presentation. I think that is very important because I don't know other way to to decoloniality, <laughs> to to the praxis, to the decolonial praxis uh, should be a collective effort. And I, I was very surprised, very nice surprise, how you you can do it. This kind of different point of view, different perspective. Uh, so, uh, mis felicitaciones. <laughs> for your presentation. Um, and uh, I think two, two comments. I think the, it's very important, the question of the virtual, no, the, the digital world, uh, because you are people from different countries. And this is a, uh, another important thing. When you can exchange your, uh, your thoughts, your feelings, your dances, uh, your political experience from different uh, Latin American countries in this case. So I think that this is a very important be, uh, the coloniality praxis began to, to think in relations, in dialogues between different countries. And I, I also feel that the question of the intergenerationalidad, sería intergenerations, is very important because here uh, uh, sucedió algo muy mágico, <laughs> something magic happens that uh, Juan was um, speaking about praxis and Samuel Araujo uh, tried a lot of bibliography of their group. So I think that other important thing in this collective effort is the question of the intergenerations, no? You are young students, young people from different countries, others uh, are more uh, elders. <laughs> and I think that this kind of um, communication is very important and is not very, um, very common in the scholar, no? We need to... Uh, Transcender, no? The, to uh, my English is <laughs> uh, the, the question of the hierarchy, hierarchies between professor and student. I think that this is other important challenge for the coloniality. Uh, different countries, different generation, different gender is is also very important in your presentation. So thank you so much. <laughs> it's a comment, but to. <laughs> For for uh, for new comments, <laughs> thank you. It seems I've been uh, uh, hidden. Can I speak? It's a girl. Yes, please, professor. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't know what got my camera. I I'm starting now. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, I think, uh, as uh, Sylvia also mentioned, that just by presenting something like this from a region makes us aware that there is material from that region that uh, would be um, 
or should be finding its place on uh, in the sort of mainstream uh, academic discourse. Uh, now I'm thinking, do you foresee that you want to be a, a, a part of the mainstream course, mainstream uh, uh, discourse, or do you think that it would be better to uh, develop separate streams along the mainstream, sort of, do you want to have a, a, a South American discourse, for instance, as a stream, as a part, identifiable part of the, of the mainstream, or do you want to be sort of merged totally into the mainstream and made you, make your voices heard he there? One problem about uh, the latter to be part of a mainstream is, of course, that who is setting the agenda of what is important? Maybe it is uh, necessary to uh, de redefine the agendas of what we want to know and maybe then uh, stand out as something different so that people around the world are able to find you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vaca. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I was out of the meeting for a second there, problems with my Wi-Fi, but I will love to continue. There's, if there's a response to that, to that question, to that comment, or a continuation. <laughs> um. Could I say something about that? Yes. Maybe we all Please. have something to say. Uh, I don't know if I understood exactly your question, Egil. Uh, I take it to be maybe two options. One is, do we want to be part of a mainstream or do we want to become a mainstream? Maybe am I understanding that? Yeah, so I don't know. I, I don't think we have thought about mainstreamness just now. <laughs> maybe um, I, I think that this question, is, is there something um, that we can really call a Latin American or something that we can call an epistemology? Um, this is a, that is proper to Latin America that is clearly different from what Europe can contribute with. I think this question was uh, raised already in the 70s, but it's an important question. And in our case, we are not really um, only occupied with answering it uh, in the sense of enunciating knowledge. Um, but I think that uh, maybe this has been part of what has moved us and also like the world is screwed and what can we do about it? That, that's really what we are thinking now. So, um, and in that sense, uh, I think that we do have to develop original ideas. If it's going to be first, probably as part of some mainstream, maybe. We, it would be great. I see, for example, a very dear friend and colleague, Maria Peredo here, right? And I, I think it's very nice if we can join forces and make, and, and of course, Silvia Citro and, and make something happen, you know? So I think that's, that's the way I would view it. Right now, maybe the summary to my answer is, I cannot answer your questions because we have not thought about mainstreamness, but we are more occupied with what we can do just now and how we should take position given the, the world situation that we're living in. May I just say, aren't you too mod modest? Is it not a problem that the mainstream is formulated on agendas that may not be so important for the rest of the world as for those who are making the mainstream, being the mainstream, so to speak? And that's why I'm asking, would it be good to put some agendas up that could give you a separate part of the mainstream? Maybe an answer to this is that we want to be able to transit between the mainstream and the non-mainstream. We want to be able to, well, have a, uh, well, construct the pluriverse, as we were saying in the presentation, and be able to listen and, and to uh, have voice in different 
in different spaces. So, yeah, I would say that we want to transit and we want to, to through this transit, have dialogues with different groups. And maybe this way we, we will be able to transform this response and this group of world that we are living in and through practice and through also thinking and being together and yeah, and creating collectives. I don't know if my colleague Maho also wants to add something to that, but I, from my part, I was thinking on on the, the this maneuver, the shift, the, this corporealizing or this uh, embodiment shift that we were referring to, because somehow I, I I am framing it as this possibility or this or, or the accent being shifted from the ideas also to the bodies. I I was thinking about the. I was wondering about the overlapping between the decolonial perspective and the embodiment perspective, because uh, both of them are somehow um, questioning the ways in which we produce knowledge and what we consider to be knowledge. Uh, and even the platforms that, that we have available for those knowledges to be, to be seen or to be tangibilized. And so in that sense, I, I am happy to see that through through the, this overlapping and these interconnections, we slowly start thinking about not only which, not only in the realm of ideas, but also in, in the realm of the bodies that are carrying those ideas. And I think that that should also be accounted for if, if we are envisioning a certain agenda. It's before the ideas, it's, it's the bodies who are putting forward those ideas as well. That's what I thought. I don't know, Maho, if you want to add something. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for your question, Professor Regil. Um, I'm just thinking about the word rigorosity and trying to um, put it into crisis. Like, what is rigorosity? Because I think there are already a lot of streams for knowledge generation and for knowledge building, but they are not all considered rigorous according to the structures of power. So I think uh, from our discussions that we have been having for a year, maybe one of my conclusions for today, because it's an ongoing process, would be that uh, it should be, there should be some freedom. I don't know if the, is the right word, but yeah, some freedom to build your rigorosity according to your interest and according to what you see, according to the authors that that think that you think enrich your research or your research center or research collective. And that um, should be um, relative, the rigorosity. Only, you know, like there, there should be, like Professor Georgiana once said, <laughs> like we we just have dialogue in our practices. So I think difference and diversity and pluriverse is what, and difference of streams, it what makes us reach other paths in, in the generation of knowledge. And, and I think that's the word that comes to mind, <laughs> that rigorosity is not just, you know, um, um, defined from a, or determined from a center of power, but that is economical, that is political, that is geopolitical, but also uh, um, relativized to these other um, geographies and interests and practices and so on. So this is my, my thought for now. Thank you, Maho. Um, if there's uh, someone else who would like to expand on this discussion, we are... So, Vaka, if you want to respond to any of these issues being raised, the mic is open. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes, thank you, if I'm allowed. Um, so, for instance, uh, one question I've raised early, earlier is the question whether the term dance is only uh, to be defined 
as an artistic, uh, uh, with an artistic intention, or if the intentions of dance being, for instance, um, a building of social relations, uh, is that, uh, as I see it, the idea of art is, uh, to a large extent, an idea of uh, the uh, colonization. And in uh, most places, dance was a product, a, a, a factor or a tool to uh, build community and interact in the community and the quality, the aesthetics of it was uh, uh, appreciated, but was not the central core of it. And uh, as I see it now, the world has uh, taken over uh, dance as only an artistic practice. That's what is uh, thought of all over the world. And there is no very few places where dance is uh, uh, taught as uh, social practice uh, with the value of social interaction. And for me, that is an important problem of colonization in terms of dance. And yes. Is Thank you, Professor. And before passing the space for Professor Su Wing Bank Tan, I would just like to briefly mention on this topic uh, that has been raised of the sociability or the artistic values of dance, because I do, I, I would like to bring into consideration the current iterations of dance in digital spaces. And I'm thinking about social media and TikTok and digital platforms where videos of people dancing have millions and millions of views and reposts and somehow the, the, the practice itself, the corporeal practice itself has regained a, a level of, uh, or a value for sociability, of course, under different conditions and different uh, situations. But I do think that it's fruitful to think in parallel to between traditional dancers and these new iterations of dance in digital spaces, because um, in some situations that they do collide as collective modes of expression. And uh, I remember hearing uh, one colleague, Nina Davis, talking about how for, for the cases of copyright of dance movements uh, on for the case of Fortnite, this video game, both traditional dancers and new dancers that were um, young dancers that were uh, disseminating their works over digital spaces, they both were struggling to protect their dance movements. And they were both um, uh, having uh, these uh, similarities in the, in the condition of production of their dances being collectively held and transmitted from one another. And I remember that both of these groups were having trouble to um, tangibilize or protect their dances from uh, an intellectual property um, perspective. And so this is connected to some of the things that we were mentioning before of thinking about decoloniality as a common set of struggles or the possibility to build bridges with different interests or different communities that are fighting for, for, against different, um, uh, for different causes. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead with Professor Sui Bengtan and then with Professor Nagwa as well. Uh, thank you very, very much for a very thought-provoking uh, session. Um, actually, I, I think that there are a lot of similarities uh, in Latin American decolonial thought with uh, other countries that also have gone through uh, the whole uh, you know, gone through the process of being colonized and are still being colonized uh, even after uh, getting independence. Um, so I, I, I actually learned quite a lot and I would like to ask if you can share with us um, how do you, um, you know, uh, practice this idea of praxis in your teaching of music and dance um, and, and this is something that we are also thinking about uh, here in Malaysia. Yeah. Thank you so very much, Professor. And then 
I'm wondering if one of my colleagues wants to take up on that. I think maybe we could pass to Professor uh, Nagwa also to make her question, then we can uh, finish because we have a little time. Sure. There are two idea. different questions. I was responding to Egil Baka's question. So, and I think, I think uh, Dr. Sui's question is more important. I can, we can always continue the others. So please take, I would respond to hers first. Okay, so um, maybe I can start. I think uh, as a, a Brazilian that uh, had, a, I was trained in education from a very critical uh, point of view as very free and from Paulo Freire point of view, the, the idea of education as a dialogue, as a very, a very horizontal way of thinking education as taking the, the person I'm, I'm teaching as also someone that I can learn a lot from. And all of this uh, it, it goes a lot with my practice as a, also a dance teacher and a, a dance researcher. So uh, being always, always in this position of dialogue and, and trying to learn at the same time I'm teaching is basic uh, my teaching praxis. So that's my answer. Mm -hmm. and Thank you, Nai. And then I think also Juan wanted to add on that. Yes. Um, well, there are, there are maybe two different spaces. Uh, when I when I have taught Zapateo, um, it is a dance that requires a lot of concentration. So one can easily like focus only on that. But I think that the the nice thing is to to I like very much this concept of affects, and uh, it, it is very Spinozian. But I think that it gives us a lot of power to think about where we are embedded, how we affect each other when we are dancing and listening to each other's sounds. So, um, and what I like, uh, for me, it is more notorious in music than in dance. Maybe like it's a very subjective thing, but when two sounds are not, you know, really matching, you can hear that. So making sound together is a very powerful way of creating collective affect. And I, I think that uh, for me, transformation, well, it has been said already, it's, it's about building community and harmonizing sound is a way to do this, but also to realize that sometimes the world is operating on us and that we have the power of operating on other people and on the world as well. This very simple uh, notion um, can, can already create an awakeness, right? So in other words, when I teach, I try to blend in some philosophy, right? Some reflections about, about life, about what we're doing that maybe do not have to be from an Afro-Peruvian. Sometimes I talk about Victoria Santa Cruz, but it doesn't always have to be the case. So that would sort of be my approach. And just to end this, I gave my students in mechatronics the, the allegory of the cave to read by Plato. And they, they came up with these beautiful reflections, Stu engineers, right? That would usually not be valued about this. So for me, this is this kind of reflexive awareness and, and discovering that we are in a cave or any other metaphor from any other tribe that you like, it doesn't matter. But this, uh, this sort of realizing that there is suddenly a way to open uh, for me, this this is part of uh, of transformation and 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 of the decolonial turn. And uh, just to add very quickly on that, I am also a lecturer at the Faculty of Arts at, Un at Universidad Central. And something that I realized that is that since I was a student long uh, long ago in the same faculty, I was very critical of the kind of authors that we were reviewing for theater and for dance and for for, for performance art in general. And now that I was a professor, I realized that I didn't know all those names for transferring them or to show it to my students. And so, uh, of course, not all the knowledge has to come from us as professors. It can, all, it can all be generated in a circular way. And something quick that I implemented in my classes was <laughs> you, can, you can get extra points if you give me a name of a practitioner or an author from our own country that is speaking about these ideas that I'm telling you maybe from this European perspective. So if you can match me and meet me halfway, I think we can build those uh, bridges. And now, please, I would like to, since I know that we are about to finish, I wouldn't like to end this before listening uh, to Professor Nahua. Okay, um, very, very quickly, um, uh, in response to Professor Egil's question, um, Joanne K. Alim Monoku 
Mohoku Joanke uh, responded to this question in the 1970s in her article on ballet as, as ethnic dance. But ballet like poetry, da dance like poetry is multi, multi, has multiple significance uh, all at the same time, which is what makes it aesthetic. Um, it, 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 it's leisure. It's pleasure for up dancers, for performers and audience. Um, it's also personal expression. It's also community expression of community values, but at the same time, dance can also reflect, sometimes in the same dance, resistance and change. So, and part of that whole world, and that's partly the impact of, of, of your, um, example of what's got happening digitally. You know, you've got people adding changes. I have a video of older men in Yemen learning hip hop from a young kid. So, I mean, you have all of these things going on at once, but thank you all for a wonderful panel. It was really a pleasure. Thank you so much. If there is uh, one last comment of somebody who would like to participate. I think we can close up soon. Otherwise, I will, we need to wrap things up, I think, due to the time. And so, again, just to uh, thank, thank you, everybody, uh, gratitude. For, for coming for, to this session and to spend your morning or your afternoon with us. And we hope that you can join the next sessions that we will be having here for the Decolonizing Dialogues. Um, that will be it from my part and lovely to see you all. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>